Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. While I have your attention, I would like to talk about something that's been bothering me about the Cygnus data. Or not the data exactly, but how we're looking at it over land. Here's the problem. We love presenting pretty pictures of reflectivity that look like this. And then alongside it, we like to point out the high sensitivity to small spatial details, and that's all fine. But then somewhere, either alongside the figure in the text of the paper or the proposal or in the presentation, we'll say, because we have a constellation of instruments, our temporal repeat frequency is on the order of hours. And that's when somebody comes up to you and they say, whoa, you can make maps like that every day? That's cool. And then you have to say, oh, oh no, that number was derived, assuming a very coarse spatial resolution and over land, we have a better spatial resolution. So in order to get complete spatial maps, we actually have to aggregate data over days or even weeks, because the truth of the matter is, data collected over 24 hours more commonly looks like this, which let's be honest, not quite as cool. So to overcome this, we typically do one of two things. The first one is we try to spatially upscale the data. So we average any reflections that were recorded within a relatively large region, say 25 or 36 kilometers. And this way we effectively get a daily temporal repeat, but at a degraded spatial resolution. But there's a problem with this because not only are these maps not quite as pretty, which we all know is the most important thing, but if you're not super careful, they're also gonna be noisy. For example, Let's say that one of your upscaled grid cells happens to fall on the border between land and water. It's totally possible that on any given day, all of your reflectivity observations will fall over the water. Maybe the next day they'll all fall over the land, next day over water, next day over land, so that your reflectivity time series ends up going up and down and up and down, up and down and up and down. Is she okay? and it makes these data practically impossible to interpret. The other thing we tend to do is we temporally aggregate our observations over relatively long time intervals, say three days, five days, two weeks, maybe even longer. But now, even though we've kept our super cool high spatial resolution, we've totally negated the advantages of having a constellation of satellites in the first place. And we're gonna miss out on any interesting short-term variations on the surface. So what's a girl to do? Well, lately I've been wondering, what if we could spatially interpolate our observations so that we both preserve our high spatial detail without having to sacrifice temporal resolution? Unfortunately, there's a problem with traditional spatial interpolation techniques and that they tend to look pretty bad when you apply them to Cygnus data. For example, let's say that we have this nice average reflectivity map which we're going to use as our truth. You can subsample this map to see what it would look like if you only had one day's worth of data, in which case it would look like this. If we then interpolate this map using traditional interpolation techniques, we end up getting something that looks like this, which is both blurry and it has huge errors with respect to our truth. And this is really common regardless of the interpolation technique that you try. In general, Spatial interpolation has a really difficult time recreating discontinuities in data, and our Cygnus observations have a lot of them. So does this mean that we should abandon spatial interpolation altogether? No! Yes. I mean, no. Recently, I got to thinking that maybe we can use the Cygnus data we already have to come up with a smarter interpolation technique. In particular, I've been wondering if we can use past evidence of spatial relationships between nearby observations of reflectivity to then inform the values at unsampled locations. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's pretend that we want to map reflectivity over this region. Because our Cygnus footprints are shaped like hot dogs, we tend to grid our surfaces in order to more easily see how reflectivity changes over time. So any specular reflection point that falls within a grid cell is going to represent the reflectivity of that entire grid cell, even if the spatial match isn't quite perfect. What we're going to do is pretend that we're looking at Cygnus footprints across this surface with time. So obviously, depending on the day, you're going to get a different surface sampling. Now let's pretend that on some arbitrary day that you get the following observations. But the unfortunate thing is that you actually want to know what reflectivity is in this grid cell here, which I'm going to call grid cell A. But you didn't get an observation here. So what are you gonna do? Cry about it? Yeah, probably. Nope, no crying allowed, because notice that you did get an observation here, 
which we'll call grid cell B. So how can we estimate what the reflectivity might have been in grid cell A using the observation we did actually get in grid cell B? We can all imagine that there was some time in the past when Cygnus obtained approximately concurrent observations of reflectivity in both grid cells A and B. And I say approximately concurrent because it would be super rare for these observations to be collected at exactly the same time, but for now let's just say that these observations were collected on the same day. And you can plot these concurrent observations. Maybe in this instance, the reflectivity in grid cell B was about negative 26 dB, and the reflectivity in grid cell A was about negative 20 dB. But you could imagine that there were multiple days where you got observations in both grid cells, and you could plot all of those concurrent observations too. Maybe the relationship looks something like this. So in this case, there's a strong relationship between reflectivity in grid cells A and B, and we can quantify the relationship. Now that we've quantified the relationship, we can use it to estimate the reflectivity in grid cell A from the reflectivity we got in grid cell B. If on this arbitrary day, reflectivity in grid cell B was negative 15 dB, then we can use our linear regression to estimate the reflectivity in grid cell A, which in this case comes out to be negative 12.9 dB. Now, if you guys haven't paid attention, which I don't know, maybe at this point that's asking too much, you may have noticed that when we want to estimate reflectivity in grid cell A, we not only have an observation in grid cell B, but we also have observations from all of these other grid cells. So what should we do then? In my proposed interpolation algorithm, I'll argue that you should actually consider all neighboring observations, each of which have their own relationship with grid cell A. For example, the relationship between reflectivity in grid cell A and this grid cell, grid cell C, might look something like this. In this case, the relationship is pretty weak probably because you wouldn't expect there to be a strong correlation between reflectivity in a grid cell with a bunch of water in it and reflectivity in a grid cell with no water in it. But now things start to get confusing. We could independently estimate the reflectivity in grid cell A using either of these relationships along with their observed values, but when we do so, we get really different answers. So in order to get an overall estimate of the reflectivity in grid cell A, I'm going to first calculate individual estimates of reflectivity using each of these neighboring cells, and then I'll calculate a weighted average of those estimates using the correlation coefficients of our previously established relationships as weights to come up with a final estimate for the reflectivity in grid cell A. So if we're using observations from both grid cells B and C, we can then estimate the reflectivity in grid cell A like this. And in this case, we get an overall value of negative 13.49 dB for grid cell A. Finally, although in this example, I only used observations in grid cells directly adjacent to grid cell A for my interpolation, in theory, you could expand your search to grid cells further away. So that was a conceptual example. But what does this actually look like when we use real Cygnus data? For the example I'm gonna show you guys today, we're gonna try to interpolate Cygnus data that were collected over this region. I always like using this area as an example because there are large and clear contrasts in land cover type and surface hydrology with a really cool dichotomy between one of the largest agricultural regions in the world that's sandwiched in between deserts. In order to implement the new interpolation method, first we have to grid our surface. And today I'm going to use grid cells that are three by three kilometers in size, which are so small that when we're zoomed out like this, they render kind of funny on the screen but once we zoom in, we can see them more clearly. Let's pretend for a moment that you are aiming to get an interpolated reflectivity observation in this grid cell. Before we can do that, we need to first establish our spatial relationships between reflectivity observed in this cell and reflectivity observed in neighboring cells. In the examples I'm going to show today, I use data from 2018 through 2020 as a calibration time period and then I'll use data from 2017 as my validation time period. We also have to calculate and store these relationships for every single three kilometer grid cell in our region. And when I say this, in my mind, I'm like, wow, this sounds like a lot of work, but trust me, it's not actually that bad. Once you've calculated all of your spatial relationships, if you want to interpolate reflectivity in this grid cell and you have an observation in this grid cell, then you can now derive what that interpolated value is. And note that in this cartoon, I've shown you this two cell neighborhood search region. In the examples I'm going to show, I used a nine cell neighborhood search region to derive my spatial relationships from. Though at this point, the choice of that was pretty arbitrary. So let's dive right into the results. On the left, I'm showing average reflectivity from April of 2017. 
And one thing to point out is that data from much of this year often didn't have all eight satellites in operation. So the spatial coverage of the monthly average is actually a little more sparse than in subsequent years. Data in 2017 until December also didn't collect reflections coming from surface elevations greater than about 600 meters, which also leads to some spatial gaps. Anyway, so the average reflectivity map on the left is our truth. And what I'm showing on the right is the same map except it's been subsampled to represent the data that might have been collected over 24 hours when all eight satellites were in operation. So just to make it clear, the values in our thinned map are the same as in our truth map. There are just fewer of them. Using our new interpolation method, we can interpolate the thin map and then compare it against our truth map to see how well we do. And this is what our interpolated surface looks like. Because we use data from 2018 to 2020 as a calibration time period, we can fill in some of the spatial gaps that occur because the surface elevation exceeded 600 meters. What I was hoping to see is that we are able to recreate the high spatial variability present in Cygnus data with minimal blurring. This is the error between the two maps, which I've defined as the true surface minus the interpolated surface. The gray tracks indicate where our thinned observations were, and so by definition, the error there will be zero. I'm honestly pretty happy with these errors, and they're way smaller than the errors I showed previously when we tried to use typical interpolation techniques on our data. The mean error here was 0.12 dB with a standard deviation of about 2 dB. And even though we under or overestimated reflectivities in some areas, I'd say in a very general sense, we did a good job recreating our true surface. In the figures that follow, for the sake of time, I'll no longer show you these error surfaces, but I'll include them in the paper that I maybe might possibly finally submit someday. So now I'm showing our next true surface that I'm going to try to interpolate, which was the average reflectivity for May of 2017. Again, on the right, I'm showing our thin surface, which I'll use for the actual interpolation. And here's our interpolated surface, which, Honestly, both true surfaces from April and May look pretty similar, so the interpolated surfaces also look pretty similar. But once we get to June, things have started to change, with average reflectivity increasing in the north. And we also see an increase in reflectivity in our interpolated image. By July, things are really happening, with really high reflectivity in the north and near that peninsula in the south. And our interpolated surface, by and large, recreates these changes pretty well. In August, things are starting to calm down. Reflectivity is still higher than it was in the spring, but not as high as July, and our interpolated surface reflects that. By September, we're almost back to the average reflectivity we saw in the spring, and the same goes for October and November. And finally, we have December. Again, in December, Cygnus started collecting data from above 600 meters in elevation. So now with those data, we are able to interpolate that arid region in the Northwest. So what's the takeaway here? Well. If you have 24 hours worth of Cygnus data, you can now interpolate it to get an idea of what the entire reflectivity surface might have looked like without needing to egregiously upscale it or aggregate data over an excessively long time interval. Now I know that some of you are probably sitting there just thinking of all the applications where this won't work. And totally, I'm not advocating that this method be used for every application. Obviously, if you're trying to do some sort of analysis where you need exact knowledge of reflectivity at a certain point, then you might not want to use this method. After all, there's always the possibility that our unknown true surface will actually deviate from our previously established relationships. And in that case, this method will fail. At the end of the day, any interpolated surface is just an educated guess. So I'm hoping that this guess is a little more educated than others. So if you have an application that requires rapid estimates of reflectivity and you're okay with a little bit of uncertainty, which after this year, I would think we'd all be a little more okay with uncertainty, then I hope you'll consider this method. So thank you guys so much for listening to this. And if any of you would like to collaborate, just shoot me an email and hopefully I'll see you in person soon.